Uh, good afternoon, everyone. My name is Nathan Doerr, and I'm the curator here at the Draper Natural History Museum here at the Buffalo Bill Center of the West. Thank you so much for joining us for today's lunchtime expedition, the last one for our uh, 2020 series. Uh, we've got a full house today uh, and could be more to, excited to have everybody joining us. Uh, support for the Draper's Lunchtime Expedition series has been made possible through the Nancy Carroll Draper Charitable Foundation and Sage Creek Ranch, and we're grateful for that. These sponsors help make these programs possible, but we're also grateful to all of you uh, from joining us from clearly all over the United States, uh, as well as your, your feedback and support. Certainly, if you have any uh, ideas for future speakers, please don't hesitate to reach out and let us know. We are recording these lectures and uploading them to our Draper YouTube channel. So if you've missed any of our previous speakers, you can find their talks there. If you'd like to be added to our email list for notices of upcoming lunchtime expedition programs, please send an email to Corey at Corey A, that's C-O-R-E-Y-A, at Center of the West. Org. We'll throw that in uh, the chat feature here in a bit. We are also broadcasting today's uh, presentation over Facebook Live. So whether you're joining us here on Zoom or via Facebook, feel free to submit your questions using the Zoom's chat or Q&A features or on Facebook using the comment section. And as I mentioned, we'll relay those questions uh, to Trevor later on in the presentation. So with further, without further ado, uh, today we are joined by Trevor Bloom, community ecologist for the Nature Conservancy Wyoming chapter and a research associate for the Northern Rockies Conservation Cooperative. Trevor grew up in Jackson, Wyoming, surrounded by nature in the shadows of the Tetons. Trevor studied biology as an undergraduate at Lewis and Clark College, where he assisted in the discovery of two new species of spiders in a cave in the Dominican Republic. He later received a Master of Science from Western Washington University, specializing in the effect of climate change on high elevation species in the Rocky Mountains. He documented his research in the short film, Climb It Change. Trevor believes that in the power of public outreach to inspire others to take action for conservation and will share various opportunities to volunteer as a citizen science in person and virtually on some really exciting and ongoing research projects. So please help me welcome our December lunchtime expedition speaker, Trevor Bloom. Great, thank you. Thank you so much, Nathan, for the opportunity. And I'm, I'm so excited to have everyone here. Thank you so much for being here. So I'm gonna go ahead over here and share my screen. Let me get that all um, going and make sure that I have the chat window up. All of that is good. Actually, real fast. Everything is optimized. Great. So um, I am monitoring the chat here. I'll, I'll, I'll keep an eye on it if I can. And so let me know if everybody um, has any, any questions. So thank you very much for, for having me. Um, and thank you for the introduction. Um, this talk is titled Retracing History Reveals Ecological Shifts in the Greater Yellowstone. And this work was also conducted by my colleagues Corinna Reginos and Donna O'Leary who are not here today. So what to expect in the, the next hour? I'm gonna um, give a brief introduction of myself. Um, we're gonna look at the big picture and then we're gonna zoom in to the greater Yellowstone ecosystem. I'll also be sharing some um, videos with you. Um, and um, don't worry, we'll send you links to those videos in case uh, the streaming doesn't work too clearly for you. Um, then we're going to focus on some of this research. We're really going to dive deep into the research that I've been conducting over the last four years. And I'll present some opportunities at the end of how you can get involved. And then there will be time uh, to answer questions at the very end. So my, my passion for science really is a product of, of growing up in, in Wyoming. 
you know, I had the amazing opportunity of growing up in Jackson, Wyoming. I always loved going outside, got involved with programs like Teton Science School. And I just kept looking for opportunities that would get me outside. So I've had field work um, take me all over the world. I've, I've traveled to over 31 countries, um, a lot of that for, for science. And, and it's an amazing opportunity to be able to come home and, and work in Jackson Hole as a, as a biologist. So I'm here representing uh, several organizations, the first of which is the Nature Conservancy. And as many of you might recognize, that's a picture of Heart Mountain there in Cody. Um, TNC, or the Nature Conservancy, is the world's largest environmental organization. It's in 72 countries, all 50 states. And um, here in Wyoming, we have the Wyoming chapter, and then I'm based in, in Jackson. What sets the Nature Conservancy apart is we have a really, really strong science team. Um, we, we make science-based decisions. We're also a land management agency owning preserves um, and holding conservation easements all across the world. And then um, really passionate about um, outreach and education. The other organization I'm representing is the Northern Rockies Conservation Cooperative. They are a, um, a conservation nonprofit based in Jackson, Wyoming, but um, have, again, have research associates located all over the world and artists in residence, educators in residence. So if you want to find out more, please, please look into NRCC. They're, they're a really great um, organization. And, um, you know, something that I've been really passionate about is the, the balance between science and, and outreach. So, you know, science is really important, but the science is often, often quite clear on a lot of these issues. Um, but the outreach isn't, isn't there, you know, and, and I think outreach is really, really important when talking about difficult topics such as climate change. So, in addition to doing research, I've also been making films. I, I, I produced this film recently, Climate It Change, uh, which is available online. And then I also um, continue to do guided trips throughout the greater Yellowstone through um, Guides of Jackson Hole. So again, difficult, difficult issues like, like climate change. You know, when we think about climate change, we're, we're usually introduced to it on, on, a, on a global level. Um, thinking about how the world is warming. We think about big natural disasters like fire, drought, and weather. Um, but what about, what about on a more local scale? What about climate change in the greater Yellowstone ecosystem in, in the backyard of the West? So the, the main thing is that temperatures are, are getting warmer. Um, in Teton County in particular, um, we've had our minimum temperatures increased by about two degrees Celsius since the year 1970. And as you can see on this graph, um, the minimum, mean, and maximum temperatures have all increased. But minimum temperatures are really important for controlling um, ecological factors like, like uh, the spread of um, disturbances, like um, pine beetle outbreaks, as well as um, monitoring snowpack. So, as a result of these increased temperatures, we've actually had a reduced winter snowpack and an earlier snowmelt timing, and then, and then increased frequency of, of wildfires. And this is true across the, the entire greater Yellowstone ecosystem. So I was showing you data from Teton County, but across the GYE, we're seeing issues um, um, increased, increased wildfire, um, and the, the change in wildfire could transform um, the, the greater Yellowstone ecosystem by the 21st century. There's some work that shows that that fire could become so frequent we could turn a lot of our forested ecosystems actually into non-forested ecosystems or, or grasslands by 2100. Um, also, there's on, on, a, on a, uh, a closer time horizon, because of warmer temperatures and reduced snowpack, um, the prospect of traveling into Yellowstone in the winter on an oversnow vehicle um, is greatly reduced. And you'll even see that with, with concessionaires traveling to and from Yellowstone in the winter. They're, they're transitioning from those tractor treads um, on the bottom of their, their snow coaches to things with big wheels that can go over bare patches of ground. Um, we're also seeing implications on the ski resorts. One that really hits close to home for me and is a very obvious effect of climate change is the melting of glaciers. 
This is a picture of Mammoth Glacier taken in 1936. Uh, Mammoth Glacier is in the Wind Rivers right at the foot of Gannett Peak, the highest peak in Wyoming. And I had the pleasure of going there uh, with the Bridger Teton National Forest as part of their glacier monitoring program this summer, and this is what I saw. So you can see from this image that Mammoth has receded by 610 meters or 25%. Of, so the toe is now uh, 610 meters away from it was and the, the depth of the glacier is significantly reduced. And th this is a pattern that we're seeing all over the world. But this is really a story of phenology. And phenology is the seasonal timing of ecological events. Anything from when birds migrate to when elk migrate to when plants flower, events that happen at the same time approximately every single year, and they're, they're cued by the seasons. So as a result of climate change, these phenological events that have happened at the same time every single year are shifting. And changes in phenology often preview changes in abundance of these animals or these um, plant populations. And there can also be some negative implications like a phenological mismatch. And, and what that is, is that many, many events um, phenological events respond to day length cues. Things like migrations of hummingbirds. They're, they're down in Mexico, um, a broad-tailed hummingbird, for example, and they um, respond to the length of the day and then they make their migrations up to the Rocky Mountains. Well, a plant like a scarlet gilia is responding to temperature. And what's happening is that these plants are um, flowering increasingly earlier and the animals that are responding to day length cues, the photo period isn't changing and they might miss um, the peak nectar source. And that's what we call a phenological uh, mismatch. So this story really begins with the Craigheads. So Frank and John Craighead, they were, they were twin brothers who lived out here in Jackson, Wyoming. They're really famous for their studies on grizzly bears. They actually invented telemetry or radio tracking animals. They basically, you know, duct taped um, old Navy buoys that pinged radio signals to, to grizzly bears and then it became more advanced from there. And, and now we use telemetry all over the, all over the world. They also studied raptors, um, rivers, and, and plants. They were really interested in plants. And Frank Craighead, one of the brothers here on the left, um, became very interested in phenology. And he started making near daily walks from his cabin, which is now in Grand Teton National Park. They, they were on a homestead um, and is now surrounded by Grand Teton National Park. And he started making daily notes of, of what he saw, the plants that he saw, the animals that he saw. And he did this for years in the 1970s. And um, he came together and the last book he published um, before passing away was called For Everything There Is a Season, The Sequence of Natural Events in the Grand Teton Yellowstone Area. And that book, um, which was also um, republished under the name of A Naturalist Guide to Grand Teton and Yellowstone National Park, is really the foundation of this story. So let's begin with a film. Wyoming's four distinct seasons, a natural clock, set by Earth's rotation and the tilt of its axis. It's driven the cycles of all life since before the dawn of humanity. The vernal equinox, when the length of day exceeds the night, marks the onset of spring. In the 1970s, biologist Frank Craighead began making observations on the seasonal timing of ecological events and published the popular book For Everything There Is a Season. And the Craighead's research was a family affair. Dad used to take us out all the time 
So I look at it now, look at these photos, and there's a 10-year-old kid. You know, these are real living, live grizzly bears. And I'm sitting there with it, claws this big. And here's a 10-year-old kid holding it. The bear's alive, it's breathing, and it's looking at me. You know, it was just, I can't believe they did it. Forty years later, Trevor Bloom is retracing the footsteps of Frank Craighead. Do you think he was aware of climate change at that point? He knew it was coming. I don't think he knew that it, it was already here, but it's definitely here. And the results are startling. Pretty crazy to think about that in just 45 years, the onset of spring is two to three weeks earlier now than observed by your father. I mean, that's not that long. And it happened fast. The glaciers are, are disappearing, you know, the different layers, the ice and the hoarfrost and the, the snow pack itself. He wasn't just looking at temperatures. He was out in the field looking at when the flowers bloomed and when the ground squirrels came up. The red-tailed hawks would come back. Snow already gone. The ground squirrels were harder to find. You know, the bears, you see them digging up ground squirrels. I think it all kind of starts with snow, right? We're getting snow coming later, so they're going into hibernation later, and then they're coming out earlier. The foxes and coyotes can't get to the mice. We had one summer not too long ago when there were no insects. There's nothing to eat. I just didn't see the swallows. I didn't see the bluebirds. You know, there's just so many cascading effects of the temperature changes. The rivers and the water. Temperatures are different. Why you start getting this age-old clock is off. Yellowstone has always been thought of as a refuge for wildlife. So if it's happening here, what does that mean for the rest of the world? One reason we should all be concerned is that Wyoming is a headwater state. Two-thirds of the country rely on melted snow from the greater Yellowstone. From farmers in California to Nebraska to Idaho, all depend on this water. Spring is coming to a close, and the solstice marks the beginning of a new phase. Summer. The clock is ticking. So with that, let's let's dive deeper into the research, and I'm happy to take questions on the on the film. So feel free to populate the the chat or the the question and answer um, button. But so the first step of our research was to data mine historic records. So um, starting in 2015, my colleague Corinna contacted the Craighead family to see if they still had the notes that Frank used to write the book for Everything There Is A Season. And in fact, they did. Um, and these notes were actually saved from Frank's burning cabin. His cabin um, was accidentally lit on fire and some of his family ran in there and saved boxes and boxes of um, these notes. So you can see on some of the notes, like on the corner here, um, that there's smoke stains on them from when they were almost burned. And we took these notes and we digitized them and then data mined them for dates of first flowering and other phenology. Um, so essentially we turned them into Excel spreadsheets. This work, um, similar work has, has been done in other parts of the country. Um, for example, um, scientists on um, the East Coast have done work with um, the notes of Henry David Thoreau dating back all the way to the 1800s. Um, taking notes at Walden Pond, and they replicated those studies um, in 2006 and saw that, you know, Concord, Massachusetts has warmed by about 2.4 degrees Celsius, and that plants on average are flowering about seven days earlier there. Um, similar studies have also been done at the Rocky Mountain Biological Research Lab in Gothic, Colorado, um, where they've had ongoing um, phenology observations going since the 1970s, but this is the first um, of its kind in the greater Yellowstone. So our next step was to initiate contemporary observations. 
And we have two sources of observations uh, for recording plant phenology. The first one is uh, professional scientists, mostly me, going out into the field, um, monitoring over 100 species twice a week uh, for the past several years. And then we also have a subset of species being monitored by citizen scientists all throughout the year. And um, I'll let you know how to get involved with that. So for the research collections, they're all taking place at Blacktail Butte. It's really important that we take observations at the same place that Frank Craighead took his observations. And so um, from both reading his notes and talking to his family, we know that he did a walk from his cabin right here and um, through this sagebrush field and then along the base of Blacktail Butte. And he even noted in his book the importance of making sure that you go back to the same place every single year to compare them. And so we've um, basically retraced his footsteps. And um, we're recording over 100 species, and then 51 of those species have a strong historic record, meaning um, at least three or four years on record studied by, by Frank himself. And we split the species into five different ecological groups to further analyze. Spring flowers, which are flowers that flower before June, midsummer flowers that flower in June, late summer flowers are ones that flower um, in July or later, and then we subsetted berries and invasive species because we we're interested in um, the effect on those, that particular group. So what do we collect when we're out in the field? We collect the presence or absence of leaves, presence or absence of buds, flowers, fruits, ripe fruits, senescence, which is withering or dying away, and the duration of each one of these phases. And how we can use this is we can compare those to his historic data, and then as you can see, we're going to compare it to climate information, like temperature. So our research topics, the questions we're really trying to answer. Um, one is how has phenology shifted in the past 50 years? What are the drivers? Why has it changed? What are the ecological implications or cascading effects? How can it affect wildlife? How can it affect us as humans? Um, and how can this be used to better inform restoration and mitigation? How can we use this information to help the natural world? A major component of the data collection has been citizen science, has been getting volunteers out in the field through a program called Wildflower Watch. And Frank Craig had himself said, the phenological approach to the study of field ecology tends to put one in empathy with the natural environment and reveal the inner relationship of living things to one another. Even the New York Times during the middle of uh, the pandemic um, wrote an article that says, keeping a phenological journal is one of the best things you could do for your mental health right now. So Wildflower Watch is the program that we started and it's been very successful. It's currently at four sites, uh, Blacktail Butte, of course, Cache Creek Trailhead in the Bridger Teton National Forest, the Muri Ranch in Grand Teton National Park, and at Kelly Elementary School. In the past three years, we've had over 500 volunteers record over 7,000 observations into Nature's Notebook, which is just amazing. And these people have represented over 20 countries. People have come from all over the world. And our youngest was was a young girl who was two years old, accompanied by her parents, and the oldest we've had so far is 89. So it, it really appeals to a broad audience. And the reason we use the USA NPN, or the USA National Phenological Network, is that this is an organization overseen by uh, US Geologic Survey scientists uh, that has programs all over the country to record phenology. It's well-established, quality controlled. It's been going for 10 years. Um, you can record the observations on an app on the palm of your hand or do a paper data sheet and then later input the data. And that work is actively used for research and forecast. So it's automatically updated to this big database. And you can see this map here. This is a map um, from June um, 2019, but it shows areas in red are experiencing an early spring, um, areas in blue are experiencing a late spring. So this data is analyzed in real time. And we're really excited to announce there's preliminary planning underway to expand Wildflower Watch to the Draper Museum. So I'll be out there this spring um, with, with Nathan exploring the idea of adding a, a phenology site in Cody, which I'm really excited about.
So let's meet a few of the plants. My ecology teacher at Lewis and Clark College said that botany is a lot like going to a party. It's way more fun when you know a few names there and then you can always learn a few more. So aspen, I'm sure everybody is uh, familiar with aspen trees. And this is an example of one of the phenological field guides where um, you see it in all stages of growth from early to um, early leaves to, to seed or fruit drop, early balsam root. But the trickiest part of phenology is identifying early leaves and flowering. Going out in the beginning of spring, you know, as early as mid-March, mid-April, and seeing things pop out of the ground. So um, if you guys want to um, try to answer these questions in the chat, can anyone guess what this leaf is? Dandelion, dandelion. Oh, everybody's doing great. Dandelion, exactly. Awesome. Dandelion, so dandelion leaves, great. How about this one, a little trickier? Any ideas out there? Elephant's head, I hear. Yarrow, yep, yarrow is correct. Yarrow, or Achillea millifolium, the thousand leaves of Achilles. So the leaves are very finely dissected. How about this one? This is even trickier. Geranium, awesome. Several people got it right. A lot of people got it right. Even the species, sticky geranium. Exactly, sticky geranium. So some of these species are pretty tricky. How about this one? This one should be a little easier. This is the last one. Sagebrush, yep, Wyoming sagebrush, exactly, right? So um, that is the, the hardest part is identifying them early in the spring. But long story short, I basically just hike mountains and look at flowers from, I just did the math from 2017 to 2020, I hiked Blacktail Butte over 300 times and I, I personally recorded over 48,000 plant observations. And this is what we've found. Early spring events in the greater Yellowstone ecosystem have advanced by an average of 17 days earlier than first observed by Frank Craighead. And if you see this graph, we've got day of year on the bottom or D-O-Y, day of year. Um, and then we've got a date here. And then these, this red triangle is the average of a first flowering date for that species um, that I observed. And then the blue is the average that was observed by Frank Craighead. And then the, the error bars are, are the amount of variation. Um, and as you can see, every single spring flower is now flowering earlier. There is some variation, but they're all flowering earlier. The greatest is hooded flocks is flowering up to 36 days earlier than first observed by Frank Craighead, which is pretty phenomenal. Midsummer flowers, those that begin to flower in mid-June, have advanced by approximately 10 days. And as you can see, there's a lot more variation, but in general, almost all of them are flowering earlier. Other species, other groups are, are much more variable. Late season flowers are um, three of the five that we studied are, are flowering earlier. Um, and then two seem to be flowering later, but as a whole, there's no um, significant difference in um, late flowering events um, as, a, as a whole. Berries are also variable, but consistently earlier. On average, berries, uh, the flowers of the berries are, are coming out about seven days earlier than observed by Frank Craighead. And then the sample size for non-native species is, is low. There's only three that were present in Craighead's day and are still present today. Um, but of those, they're all flowering earlier and have advanced by about two weeks. So if we look at all the functional groups, early spring flowers, the biggest effect, seven day, 17 days earlier, midsummer flowers, 10 days earlier, late summer flowers, two days earlier, but not a significant change, berries, five days earlier, and non-natives are 14.5 days earlier. 
So what's driving this? Why are they coming out so much earlier? And I don't know if I, um, you remember, but I mentioned with the data from Henry David Thoreau in uh, Concord, Massachusetts, a hundred years later, the flowers were coming out seven days earlier. So we're seeing a much larger, a much greater effect in the greater Yellowstone ecosystem. And what's driving it is temperature for one, the spring temps here have increased nearly two degrees Celsius, which is as much as they've increased in a hundred years in Concord, Massachusetts. So, the, um, and that's, that's a result of us being at a higher elevation and a higher latitude. There's elevational dependent warming. And so our spring temps have increased by about two degrees Celsius. You can see max, min, and mean temperatures have all increased since the 1970s. And the big signal, um, which is clear to see, is snowmelt timing. So snowmelt timing is the day when snow has left the ground for at least two consecutive weeks, essentially the date of spring snowmelt. So in the spring, when snow leaves the ground and then is consistently gone for two weeks is what we designate as the day of snowmelt timing. And using um, the Moose Weather Station that's taken snowpack measurements in Grand Teton National Park since the 50s, we can get that to the exact day. And this is what we see, that the day of snowmelt timing has advanced by 21 days um, since the 1970s. And phenology is correlated with climate. So what this graph is showing is you've got um, average temperature here. MAM stands for March, April, May. So spring temperature, March, April, May. And then phenology, remember DOY is day of year. And what you can see is that the phenology day of year is very correlated with spring temperature. And that correlation or the strength of a correlation is measured by a unit called the R squared. So this is the R squared. And so the R squared shows that there's a strong correlation for the flowering of arrowleaf balsam root with spring temperature. And that, you know, arrowleaf balsam root is flowering about 20 days earlier, and that's directly correlated with spring temperature. Different groups are driven by different climate variables. So early spring flowers, like shooting star or prairie star, um, these are very, um, the early spring events are tightly correlated with both spring temperature and snowmelt timing are basically what are driving this early spring events. Late events, late summer species are more tightly correlated with growing degree days. Growing degree days is, it's kind of a complicated uh, metric, but it's essentially the accumulation of warmth over the entire growing season. And um, so, so what we're seeing is that late season flowers aren't really affected as much by spring temperature, more the accumulation of warmth over the entire growing season. Um, and similar to other studies, um, such as the work with Thoreau data, show that these midsummer and late summer flowers have a lot more interannual variation than the spring flowers. Um, and spring flowers have a much stronger correlation with um, spring temperature. So here are a few examples. Yellow bells, uh, one of my favorite, they come up in the spring. They are a preferred food of grizzly bears coming out of hibernation. Yellow bells have a really starchy root. It's like a tuber. Um, and the bears are digging those out when they come out of hibernation. Um, yellow bells, very tightly correlated with average spring temperature and are coming out on average 18 days earlier than they were in the 1970s. Now here's some nuance. Choke cherry and service berry um, both fill very similar ecological niches. They both provide um, a really nutrient rich berry for bears, for birds, for humans like to eat them too. And back when Craig had um, recorded service berry and choke cherry, they flowered approximately the same day, like June 1. Now, um, or June 15th, sorry, now on June 15th, Choke cherry is still flowering. It has not changed its first flowering date at all. It's not correlated with temperature. You can see the R squared is very low. There's no clear pattern. Service berry is flowering up to two weeks earlier. So what we're seeing is 
choke cherry flowering at the same time. This picture was taken June 16th, as it was in Craighead's day. Service berry is already fruiting when it used to flower. So there is variation. But in general, um, in general, we're seeing that, that events have shifted earlier. The greatest effect is in spring flower. 65% um, of those spring flowers show an, a significant negative correlation with average spring temperature. Um, Midsummer flowers are coming out about 10 days earlier. Those late summer flowers are either not shifting or about two days earlier berries about five days earlier and non-natives um, about 15 days earlier. So some continued work on this is um, working with uh, Michael Dillon in the University of Wyoming. We have been doing uh, pollinator collections. Uh, we did them in 2018 and 2019. They did not happen unfortunately in 2020 um, due to COVID. We couldn't get the undergraduate researchers out here, um, but we are interested in it. Is um, are there going to be mismatches between the timing of flowering events and, and pollinators? And so we're continuing to collect data on that. Here are um, some examples of uh, some of the pollinators um, that were collected. We're also expanding um, the phenology work uh, GYE wide. So we have sites in Grand Teton National Park, Bridger Teton National Forest, I've been working with Yellowstone National Park um, to align their phenology work with the Grand Teton National Park work so we can directly compare results. And then an expansion to Cody um, would be a great addition um, to getting another site in the greater Yellowstone. But who cares? You know, we've got some flowers coming out earlier. What are the implications? Well, phenology can inform restoration. For one, we're working closely with vegetative scientists of Grand Teton National Park to inform the, si the timing of seed collections. So our data set um, not only has first flowering date, but we also have the date of when these plants begin to fruit. And that's really critical for sending out teams to go out and um, seed collect some of these, um, these species. It can also define a window of time for weed treatment. If you wanna spray a weed before it goes to seed, what is your window of time to send a team out there to spray them? Um, also, it informs the restoration more on an academic level of, you know, what does a resilient community look like? What species might do better under climate change? Might, which ones uh, might do worse? What, what do we expect? Um, and what do we expect with invasive species? And again, our sample size was small with three um, invasive species, but all of them were coming out at least two weeks earlier. Um, and this is musk thistle, considered an noxious weed. It was coming out 16 days earlier. And um, other research has shown that, that plants that are um, <clears throat> plastic or flexible in their response to climate will fare better under climate change. And that some of these observed effects um, could actually give weeds an increased competitive advantage over the native species. So it's important to keep an eye on these. The main takeaway um, for me is that the importance of early season forbs, early season wildflowers, and that they're really changing. Early season wildflowers are a critical food source for sage grouse during nesting. Their nesting success is directly correlated with the amount of food that they can eat from early season forbs and the pollinators that pollinate them, um, as well as it's a key food source for grizzly bears coming out of hibernation. If these plants are coming out 17 days earlier, what are the implications for the wildlife that depend on them? And early season um, plants that come out earlier, actually studies have shown that they're um, very susceptible to frost damage because what you get is the snow melt melting earlier and the plants coming up, but then you still have these, you know, mid-April, mid-May, really cold events that actually kill all the plants. So I don't know if any of you guys have, you know, cherries at home or apples. And if you get a frost event that kills all the flowers, you're not going to have any fruits later. So these early season forbs are actually susceptible um, to some of these die-off events. And we really urge that conservation efforts should target planting early season forbs. And that's one of the things we're working on with Grand Teton National Park next year is we're going to create an early season forb collection program 
to go out there and start collecting seeds of early season forbs. And if right now, a lot of early season forbs like uh, Sagebrush Buttercup and Spring Beauty and Lomatium, Desert Parsley are not available commercially, the seeds aren't, and uh, a lot of parks and forests don't even have collection programs for them because they're hiring seasonal crews that are coming out in July and August. They're not coming out in May and June. So that's a paradigm shift we hope happens, which is this um, um, restoration using early season forbs. There's a lot of big unknown questions still that this work um, doesn't fully answer. You know, how will these shifts um, affect wildlife like birds, bees, and bears? Will there be increased phenological mismatches? You know, could these things increase bear human conflicts? For example, if the berries are flowering earlier, meaning they're fruiting earlier, does that mean there's reduced food sources for those bears in the fall? Is that one of the reasons that grizzly bear 399 traveled further south than she's ever been recorded traveling this year in search of other food sources because the food sources in the fall were depleted in Grand Teton National Park? You know, that's, that's an unknown question. Also, how does this tie to migration? We know that migration, large animals like elk and, and um, antelope and mule deer surf a green wave. They follow green, a green up. And um, if that is changing, will migrations change? And which migrations might be more resilient than others? Meaning if you have a migration across a really flat topography and it all changes, it all shifts in one direction, what could that mean versus if you have a migration that goes up and down mountains, you might have totally different phenology on the north and south aspects. And that migration is likely more resilient than one that just goes across a flat desert. Also, there's social implications of, of the citizen science that we hope. We set clear learning objectives. We worked with an AmeriCorps student and Teton Science School to set clear learning objectives on climate change, native plants, habitat restoration. And we hope that increased public involvement in science and conservation um, will better prepare our future for the implications of climate change. And it's a way for people to personally connect with climate change. You know, for me to stand in the same place that Frank Craighead stood, you know, 40 years ago and see changes in real time is really powerful versus being told what's gonna happen in 50 or 100 years. That's not tangible for most people, but to see that the changes are happening now. And there is hope. It's not that this is the end of the world, but we need to acknowledge that these changes are happening and we need to be proactive. So what can you do? One thing is to just work to protect biodiversity and the land that supports it. The more land we have, the more habitat connectivity, the better these species can adapt to these changes. Speak up about climate change as if it is fact, because it is fact. Vote with your ballot and your wallet. Support work by the Nature Conservancy and Northern Rockies Conservation Cooperative and other good work um, in the state and across the West. And and also become a citizen scientist. Get out there and help us collect data. So with that, I'm gonna show another film about how you can get involved. Climate change may be the largest environmental issue of our time, especially here in Wyoming and the greater Yellowstone. We must be proactive. One of the best ways to track the effects of climate change is to observe changes in natural events. In the 1970s, local biologist Frank Craighead started recording events such as first flowering date for many species, when birds migrate, and what bears eat leading up to hibernation, a study known as phenology, and used these notes to write the popular book for everything, there is a season. Today, the Nature Conservancy in Wyoming has created Wildflower Watch, a program where volunteer citizen scientists are making observations of natural events by retracing Craighead's footsteps in Grand Teton National Park. We've already witnessed flowers, such as airleaf balsam root, emerge up to three weeks earlier today due to warming temperatures and earlier snowmelt timing. This begs the question, how will the wildlife that depend on these plants respond? For example, can bears find enough to eat before hibernation 
if berries fruit and die back in summer instead of in the fall. Climate change is a huge issue, but it is not too late. Join the Nature Conservancy's Wildflower Watch as a citizen scientist and contribute valuable data to a project that can help shape the conservation of this amazing region before it is too late. So with that, I want to just highlight a few other opportunities to get involved with citizen science, especially um, if we're not able to meet in person. One is Zooniverse. We've got this other great project where we're looking at the effects of human recreation and wildlife um, on trail systems in the Bridger Teton National Forest. And we've collected all these images of humans and wildlife on these trails. And essentially on Zooniverse, it's like Instagram for animals, where we're asking people to go through, sort these images and tag them um, in a really easy and fun way. So you tag this one, you know, two pedestrians, um, they're hunters. You tag this one, a mule deer. You tag that one, a grizzly, uh, a black bear, excuse me. And that's going to help us understand um, patterns of human recreation and wildlife. Another awesome opportunity that um, I want to announce the the, the creation of is the Greater Yellowstone Botanical Tour at the National Museum of Wildlife Art. So just last week, we finalized these interpretive signs um, that are up at the National Museum of Wildlife Art. And now we're working on an accompanying audio tour and planning it with native species. So it's really, really exciting. And it's outdoors, free and open to the public. With that, I really wanna thank uh, my amazing collaborators. None of this work could have been done by myself. Um, you know, Geneva Chong at the USGS, one of my best friends and collaborators, Donald O'Leary, you know, the Craighead family, Charlie Craighead in particular, um, the National Park Service, the, the uh, Bridger Teton National Forest, Teton Science School, and um, big thank you to Nathan at the Draper Museum. So with that, um, I'd love to hand it back over to Nathan and then I can field some questions. So thank you so much for being here. Excellent, Trevor. Thank you so much. I, I can't express my, my gratitude uh, enough. Uh, we've got a lot of folks chiming in and saying that they'd be very interested in, in helping out with a citizen or participating in a citizen science program here in Cody. So we've already got some, some uh, volunteers at the ready. Uh, for those of you watching, just a reminder here on Zoom, you can submit your questions uh, via the chat feature in the Q&A. And I've got a few that have come in uh, that I'll share with Trevor here in a moment. Uh, viewers watching on Facebook Live, feel free to, to um, share your questions in the comment section and we'll, we'll pass those along. Uh, but Trevor, and I, I'm going to, uh, a quick note that um, your camera froze a bit ago. So if uh, just be aware of that. I don't know if you want to reset that. Um, but let me see. Maybe I should over. stop sharing. Do you want to? Yeah, I'm going to take over here if it cooperates. There it goes. Okay. So, uh, Trevor, one question that came up early on uh, was whether or not glaciers grow or expand during years of heavy snowfall and cool temperatures. All right, just a sec. So I'm not sure what's happening with my camera. So it's you'll just have to look at this, this picture of the grizzly bear here. Um, so will you repeat that question? Yeah, absolutely. So the, the um, uh, attendee was interested in knowing if glaciers grow or expand during years of heavy snowfall and cool temperatures. Yeah, definitely. So that's, that's a great question. Um, glaciers do grow and expand and so the I'm you know I'm not a glaciologist but essentially you get years of, um, of, of growth and years of contraction based on the snowpacks it's how much snow do you have how much does it melt so in big years big snowpack years you can have um, glaciers grow um, but in general we're seeing that you know over a period of time they're receding and at Mammoth Glacier that was my first time going there but talking to the, the glaciologists at Bridger Teton like Justin Snyder he says every single year he goes to it especially this year there's there's visible um, receding of it actually every single year that doesn't mean that we can't have a huge snowpack year and you might see it grow a meter or two that year but still in general it's receded 610 meters in the last 50 years um, so that's a that's a great question um, 
Excellent. Uh, another one from earlier up in the chat. Uh, we've got some coming in, but I'll get this one before we lose it. Uh, you mentioned that flowers respond to temperature and birds to length of day. Are there plants and animals that react to both? And if so, is one factor, temperature or length of day, dominant? That's a, that's a really good, good question. Um, and with, with wildlife, you know, I would, I would think that a lot of wildlife um, probably respond to a little bit of both. Um, plants, um, there could definitely be ones that respond to both as well, especially like seeds in the ground do respond to light and light availability. But that also is a function of snowmelt timing. When the snow melts, they start to see light. So um, it's hard to say which one is stronger than others. The thing with, with, um, with the plants, especially the early season spring plants, um, a lot of the variation in the, in the timing that they were coming out um, was, was temperature. And, and if, it was, if it was day length, you would see that. You'd see that them, they were coming out at the same time every single year. So that's, that's a really good question. And it's a, it's a much more complicated question um, when you start thinking about animal behavior. Excellent. Um, let's see, another question that came in, uh, are studies being done to observe changes in bear hibernation patterns? Uh, how are bears changing what they eat in response to changes in availability of their food sources? Yeah, that's, that's, another, that's another good um, question. And there is, there is some work being done. I'm not um, a huge expert on it, but there is work being done and, and anecdotally, you know, if you talk um, with the Craigheads, especially like Lance Craighead, who's a um, bear biologist still. Um, and I've also talked to people up at the um, uh, Wolf and Bear Discovery Center up in the um, West Yellowstone. Um, there's a lot of kind of anecdotal evidence that says that bears are going in much later um, and that bears are also sometimes not going in at all. The big confounding factor with that, especially in Grand Teton National Park, has to do with the elk reduction program, the hunting, and the bears are feeding on gut piles. So it's, it's hard to parse out if the reason the bears are staying out longer is really a climate change thing, or just the fact that because there's all these gut piles on the National Elk Refuge and um, in Antelope Flats, that that's one of the reasons that they're staying out longer too. Excellent. Great Good question. Uh, you mentioned only, uh, you mentioned three species on the non-native plants that still exist in present day. Uh, are there any other plants that Frank had observed, but no longer in the present day study? Yeah, that's a really good question. And fortunately, the answer is, is no, they're all still present. So that's, that's good news. Um, there's nothing that he observed that today um, is no longer is no longer present. Now, if um, going back to that study with Henry David Thoreau, they've actually seen some local extinction events. And that's where that statement that shifts in phenology can preview a local extinction or a, a decrease in population. Um, but, but also those places, right, have seen a lot more disturbance than in Grand Teton National Park. So fortunately, all the all the species that he observed are still present today, and that's one of the beautiful things about, you know, Grand Teton National Park. Great. Uh, a question, uh, talking about citizen science programs and, and working with them so closely as you have, uh, what is your favorite thing about citizen science programs? Oh, man. There's, I, I love, I mean, one, I just, I really love, uh, teaching and interacting with people and I think doing that in an outside setting is is really powerful so I love seeing people form a personal connection with place and um, with native plants so I just like being outside uh, outside with people really um, and giving them an opportunity to to learn on their own and I think the reason I enjoy that so much is that's it's definitely why I am a scientist. You know, I participate in Teton Science School, and then I was also lucky enough to participate in Knowles National Outdoor Leadership School, 
um, when I was 19. And when I was outside for 88 days doing place-based education, that's when I decided I, I wanted to be a field scientist. So I, I feel like, you know, an honor and also kind of an obligation to, to pass that on to other people. Wonderful. Uh, there are also uh, not so much a question for you, but uh, some exciting news for you. As I mentioned earlier, there are a lot of folks who are expressing interest in uh, being a citizen scientist uh, in a phenology program here in the Cody area. And so I just want to mention, and I'm going to throw it here in the chat here in a moment, uh, but as Trevor mentioned, and again, this is uh, Nathan Doerr, uh, curator here at the Draper. Uh, it's a project that we're working on and I'll be proposing uh, here in the coming month or two. I've been doing a lot of preliminary work and conversations with Trevor, uh, but I would say that in the meantime, if you're interested in potentially uh, volunteering with a phenology program uh, associated with Wildflower Watch here in the Cody area, uh, please do email me and I'm sending my email address in the chat feature right now, uh, but uh, Nathan D, N-A-T-H-A-N-D, at center of the West, oops, I forgot the dot org uh, on, on there. Um, but do reach out, let me know that you're interested and, and um, I'll share updates as we progress in the planning. Um, let's see, I think that about catches us up. One question I had, you know, uh, thinking your, your work before uh, Wildflower Watch and, and your, uh, your graduate program and your graduate research, I know you had lots of amazing experiences exploring uh, the effects of climate change on these high elevation species. What are some of your most or one of your most uh, memorable moments throughout that experience? Hmm. Um, I think I think most memorable is you know being being up in the Alpine um, in in Montana and just getting caught in a thunderstorm in the Alpine. I think that's one of the scariest things and being above tree line and being in a huge thunderstorm and having you know the hair on your arms stand up and if you've got climbing gear the climbing gear on you buzzing um you know that that's definitely um some of the most memorable that and just getting to to do alpine research um in the greater yellowstone you know I've, i got to travel all the way from central new mexico all the way up to jasper climbing 76 peaks and i still look at the Tetons and think they're some of the most beautiful mountains out there. Um, That's great. And, and with that, I, I want to do another plug. Uh, I'm, I'm sending all those links out again in chat. Uh, your uh, mini doc uh, climate change uh, is absolutely phenomenal. And I really encourage uh, attendees to, to go and check that out. Again, we've, we've included uh, a link for some information on that. Uh, another question. Um, well, it did come in and then I completely lost it. Uh, has there been any similar work about uh, grass phenology in the greater Yellowstone ecosystem? Yeah, that's a, that's a really good um, question. And not, not too much that I, I know of, um, but that is something we hope to start this spring is actually um, start adding, I was recording a few grass species. Frank Craighead did not record any grass species, at least not um, enough uh, observations um, to make it into the data set. But we're starting to do that now, um, in particular, you know, with Grand Teton National Park to inform some of the seed collections. When's the best time to go pick blue bunch wheatgrass? And um, so, there is a student at the, the University of Wyoming, Sienna Wessel, who's interested in helping me get that going. And if anybody else is, that's that would be great because grasses are even harder than wildflowers to identify before they flower. Um, they're really, really hard. Um, so if, if, if anybody knows any experts or is interested in, in that, um, but we have been doing it on a few species, especially the non-native species. I've been recording it on grass uh, for a few years to get a good idea of when that is is flowering. I did see another question up here too that was um, um, from Caroline that says it's easy to dismiss climate change when we have particularly a cool summer and cold winter 
but early arrival of seasons and plant flowering is something anyone can observe themselves. Why isn't this information publicized more as a part of public climate change arguments? And I think that's a great question. I would, I would love to get it more in the public eye, and that's why we've been working on these films. Uh, the USA NPN, um, you know, that program, they've made it into the newspaper quite a bit about the earlier arrival of spring being a very clear pattern of climate change. But it's true, and and the thing is, with with Wyoming, um, with some of that temperature data that I shared, um, you might see that the 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 smallest effect is actually on our um, maximum temperatures. So it's not like we're getting you know a bunch of days, a hundred degree days. That's not what's happening. It's that the minimum temperatures are rising um, quite a bit, and so it's not getting as cold as it used to. Um, and, you know, a lot of people will say that, well, it's not getting any hotter. Um, and, and it, it, it is on average getting a little bit warmer, the average temperature. Um, but it's really those minimum temperatures that people don't notice, right? You know, you're not noticing, you know, the nighttime temperatures is warmer than it used to be. Um, you know, unless you're someone that's really, really, really keyed in. So, this onset of this earlier onset of spring is a really clear signal, and it's also something people can can connect with, um, from ranchers to you know when you start talking about timing of events, you know fishermen start keying in, hunters start keying in that wow it has changed. Or I used to be able to go here and um, you know there were elk here and now there aren't any elk here right now. I wonder why that has that is. And um, so I think phenology is a really powerful way um, to connect people with with the idea of climate change. Excellent, thank you so much, Trevor. Uh, not seeing any more questions on, on Facebook or here in the chat or Q&A section. Uh, I wanna thank you, Trevor, so much uh, for taking time out of your schedule to visit with us uh, and for sharing your knowledge, experience, and, and clearly your, your passion. Uh, and also another really big thanks to our um, sponsors uh, who uh, help us with the uh, lunchtime expeditions, uh, the Sage Creek Ranch and the Nancy Carroll Draper Charitable Foundation. Just a reminder that this presentation will be uploaded to our YouTube channel. So if you missed anything or would like to share the presentation with someone, uh, you'll be able to find a link there as well as the recorded version uh, of the live on Facebook. Uh, and again, Trevor, thank you so much. It's been a pleasure uh, and we look forward uh, to more from Wildflower Watch, hopefully hear from Cody. Uh, and thank you all for tuning in. Stay tuned for our 2021 Draper Lunchtime Expedition Speaker lineup. And until then, take care and stay well. Thank you, everyone. <laughs>